OK, let's work out the predicted wavelength shift due to the movement of the Sun forwards and backwards because of a planet in a nearly edge on orbit. So for this we want the velocity of the star. Now the equation for this is a simple one. It's just the circumference the circuit has to travel in divided by the time taken to go around the period. So this remember is R1, the radius not of the orbit of the planet around the star, but just of the little circle that's been done by the star. We've already worked that out for the case of something like Jupiter orbiting something like the Sun. And here's the period, about 12 years in this case. So we can simply plug some numbers into that, and we get a velocity for the velocity of the motion of the Sun caused by something like Jupiter of about 13 meters per second. multiplied by 3.68 kilometers an hour, so we're talking about 40 kilometers an hour or so. So the speed of a rather slow car. Can we see this? Well, that will depend on the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect equation tells us the change in the wavelength of light caused by the motion divided by the wavelength of the light when it's unshifted is equal to the, the velocity divided by the speed of light. This is an approximation valid for speeds of light much lower, the speeds much less than the speed of light, and 13 meters per second is certainly much less than the speed of light. So let's assume we're looking at a wavelength of the optical, vis optical light, so say about 500 nanometers. This gives us that the wavelength shift is equal to the velocity, so 13 meters per second divided by 3 by 10 to the 8. times the wavelength, say 500 nanometers, which comes out as 2.2 by 10 to the minus 5 nanometers. So a very, very small shift in the wavelength. So Paul, you've shown us that as Jupiter orbits the Sun, it's going to cause the Sun to go through and have a small Doppler shift. Uh, equivalent to 2 times 10 to the minus 5 nanometers in wavelength. Now that's not a very big shift. Yeah, it's very tiny, but in principle you could put a really big spectrograph. These things typically weigh tons under the size of rooms, um, which could measure this sort of stuff. So you might see a spectrum with wavelength against flux per unit wavelength with, a, say, an absorption line, and it might move. Okay, so it does shift a bit, um, and so that should be measurable, as you say, if we get enough uh, light and data. So The okay. trouble is that, once again, the absorption lines are not going to be that narrow. Ah, uh, yes, because stars do different things. For example, the sun rotates at 2 kilometers per second. Or, or yep, so if we look at the sun, um, as you said, we're not going to be able to see um, the, the stars are just different parts of it. It's just going to be all one big blur. If you measure the spectrum of that big blur, say this part of the star, let's say we're looking from down the bottom here, this part of the star is moving away from us, that part's moving towards us. So the spectrum of the left-hand side is going to have a dip over there, the spectrum of the right-hand side is going to have a dip over here. You can't pick them up separately, but you've got to imagine looking at the combined light from all the different places across here, some of which are moving away, some of which are moving towards us. Add it up, you're going to get something that's quite broad. And we calculate how broad, so typical surface speed of the sun is about 2,000 meters per second. The change in wavelength over the wavelength is the velocity divided by the speed of light. So 2 over 300,000 um, comes out as about this. So that's almost a factor of 100 larger than the effect we need to measure. Yep, so once again we're in the situation of going from something like this to something like that. Well, Paul, that almost looks as hopeless as what we saw before. We were trying to measure the motion of, the star, uh, of, a, of a star like the sun across the sky. Yes, I mean, once again, we have the problem with the photon arrival noise. It's not going to be a perfect data. But we do have a few advantages here. I mean, one advantage is the shift does not depend on how nearby the star is. The sideways shift gets smaller the further away something is. But this thing, it doesn't matter how far away the star is, the shift is going to be the same. A second advantage is you don't just have one absorption line in a star, you get thousands of the things. Oh, so you can average over many, many thousand, okay. So that gives you a big advantage. And another advantage is, for looking at the wobble of a star, you had nothing to reference against, you didn't need another bright star nearby. But here what we can do is we can feed in light from a, an arc lamp or something which draws a bit to a particular wavelength and compare it against that. So we can actually build a, 
a reference right into our own telescope. Ah, so that sounds like a big deal because that, that's a big difference compared to the previous method where we didn't really have that built-in reference. We didn't have an artificial star we could put in the sky. So maybe it's not totally hopeless here. Okay. So over uh, many years, a group of astronomers, this is not the glamour job of astronomy. You had the glamour job of astronomy. Oh, we cosmologists have the glamour job. But these guys are, were, were stellar astronomers, right? And they were out measuring very, very precisely, uh, being very, very persnickety in their measurements of the motions of stars and having to really just beat down every little problem as they went along the way. And there are a lot of problems. I mean, here's how a spectrograph works. You get the light comes in from a telescope. It's brought to a focus here. It goes through a little slit at the focal plane comes to a lens called a collimator, sends into a parallel beam of light that bounces off a diffraction grating. For these mammoth spectrographs, it's a thing called a shell normally. Then that splits out the red and blue light separately. They're focused and brought to a detector where the blue light arrives in one place and the red light in another. So what could go wrong with this? So if we're here on Gemini North going on, you can see as the telescope's following the star across the sky, the telescope moves over and these are made out of metal and they're not perfectly stiff and so they're going to bend a little bit, aren't they? They're going to they're going to actually not everything's not going to be exactly still. And yeah, no matter how strong you build something, it's always going to bend a little bit as you tilt it around to point at different parts of the sky. So if your spectrograph is on your telescope, then it's bound to bend somewhat. You can try and build it like a battleship really, really heavy, and that might minimize it. But it's, again, it only needs to move by a tiny, tiny fraction of a wavelength of light to completely muck up your observation. But presumably, we can go through and engineer the telescope to try to counteract that, right? We have this ability to put a reference built into the telescope. So that's got to help on this front. Yeah, what's normally done here is actually you bounce the light sideways down a combination of mirrors, so you can actually put the spectrograph at least um, in a room somewhere else where it doesn't have to move around, or maybe run a fiber optic cable, so the light goes into a fiber optic cable and runs down to it. So that means you, the spectrograph at least can be stationary. Okay, so that's a big way to get rid of some of that bending light. But presumably we have another problem, which is the atmosphere. Well, we have a higher and a low pressure system, the refraction, refractive index of the air isn't exactly one. It depends a bit on the pressure. And I think, just thinking about it, that's going to be cause a bigger problem than the size of the measurement we want to make. Yes, that's an issue. Um, also, the temperature's going to change. You get a hot summer's day, your spectrograph will heat up, and uh, that will make every part of it expand. And also, the air inside will expand, have a different refractive index. Again, a very small effect. But even a tiny fraction of a degree is enough to move things by far bigger than the effects we're looking for. So we're going to have to overcome these as well. It seems like you're going to have to have a very, very accurate barometer. And there are also other problems they found out. For example, at the Anglo-Australian Telescope, the spectrograph, had the problem that um, they were picking up the strange noise, this extra noise in the detectors. And they couldn't figure out what was happening, so they would go into the room where it was stored and poke around. They couldn't see what was causing the noise. Then they'd go out and find the noise had got 100 times brighter. It actually turned out that the paint on the walls was fluorescing at very low levels, too faint to see with the human eye. But whenever they went on and turned on the fluorescent lights, the ultraviolet photons from the lights would be absorbed by the paint on the walls. And then when they turned the lights out again, the walls would glow a little bit for the next day or so. Uh, it turned out it's titanium dioxide in the paint, which was not known to fluoresce, but does at a very low level, was causing problems. In the end, they had to go and take every, every uh, paint in the hardware shop, paint blocks of them all on the walls, and try and work out which one glows. It doesn't actually say on the paint yeah. can, <laughs> beware, this paint will glow at incredibly low levels. Do not use astronomical spectrographs. So when you're trying to make measurements like this, every little thing ends up making it impossible to get to that level. So you just have to control every variable. But it sounds to me like, OK, so we're controlling all these variables. You have a really accurate barometer. You have, get the right paint in the room. You stabilize your telescope. You use a fiber optic feed. And you have a reference. It turns out the biggest problem was none of these. The problem was, in our spectrograph, the light comes in at this end. And here I've shown it going to the middle of the slit. But if instead the light was near the top of the slit, that means it's coming into the different angle here, hits there, different angle, different angle, different angle, and it moves the spectrum up and down here a little bit. Once again, not by very much, but still 100 times more than what we're trying to look for. OK, but Paul, this is a huge problem. Clearly, we can build a telescope 
that will be able to track that star really, really accurately, right? So I've got a star, I need to put a slit across it, and so I go through and I write a computer program that says, there's the star, put it right there and keep it there, and I make sure my hardware is stable enough to keep it right there. Yes, in principle. The trouble is that if you look at the star image very quickly, here's what it's actually looking like. Ah, that's the atmosphere, the turbulence in the atmosphere moving things around. So even if you've got your telescope perfectly lined up, the star's going to jiggle around from the top to the bottom. And you could, in principle, avoid this by going to space, um, but the trouble is you can't actually get spectrographs as big in space. The spectrographs on space telescopes, you simply can't have a many ton, 10 metre long spectrograph on a space mission. They won't fit in the nose cone of the rocket. So we have to do this from the ground, and this is going to cause our image to jiggle around all over the slit. All right, so we, this is, these things, I know the atmosphere moves around at like a thousand times a second, right? So that becomes pretty difficult to control. So how do we end up uh, controlling this? Seems almost impossible. 